Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for coming today. How many of you were there yesterday for the talk? Okay. So a few of you are not there. So today I'll speak broadly on the topic of how a spiritual vision of life can improve our way of functioning in the world. The understanding with which you can function in the world. So I'll basically talk about the principle of karma and how it can be helped by spirituality. I'll speak briefly and then we will have question answers. So when we use the word karma, hmm? so I hope it's visible to everyone. Yeah. Okay, good. So when you hear the word karma, what comes to your mind? What do you think karma means? Karma is something what we think, what we do, and what we speak. So the way of thinking, what we are saying, and what we are conducting is karma. So karma is associated with thoughts, words, actions. So are you saying that these are, all these comprise karma or... Are you saying these are the these cause of karma or what are you saying? The components of karma? I understand these are different components of karma. Okay, thoughts, words are all, they are components of karma. Okay, yes. So every, uh, every word that we speak is also a part of karma. Just like we can say from a legal perspective, if we attack someone, then there are consequences. But even if we verbally attack someone, you know, there can be libel, there can be character assassination. So even words have consequences. Yes, good, thank you. So anything else? I'm not sure about intention. Intention, we'll come to that a little later. <laughs> True. So, so basically, anything else comes to your mind when we use the word karma? It's a reaction. Karmic reaction. Okay. Karma can mean reaction. Yes. So, anything else? Duty. Karma can refer to duty, right? So you could say that it is more of the right or the responsible action. Everyone has to do their karma. Hmm? Correct. Anything else? In the modern parlance, karma comes back to you. Okay, karma is that which comes back to you. So, what goes around, comes around. That's what it is said. So here we are using the word karma more in the sense of something like a, some word starting from L, three letter word. A three, karma we are using it in the sense of a three letter word starting with L. Nishika? Common word. Three letter word starting with L, ending with W. <laughs> so we say the law of karma for example isn't it nobody can escape the law of karma so sometimes the idea of karma can be confusing because the word itself can be used with different meanings so here if you see we just look at it karma can mean action karma can also mean reaction hmm? so that means if everyone is constantly doing some karma. Krishna uses this in third chapter that nobody can be doing without doing any karma. So that is karma in terms of action. Karma can also be in terms of reaction. We will all have to suffer our karma. That means the action that we have done, we will get the reactions for it. So karma can also refer to the law of action reaction. Isn't it like the law of karma is infallible. The law of karma is inescapable. That is, human law we can escape, but the law of karma we can't. Maybe all of you can come a little ahead, please. Mm. So just... Mm. That's interesting. Sorry. I think you'll have to put this down. Maybe bring it here. Bring it here. Hmm. 
if it becomes too crowded, you can sit here with me. <laughs> so the word karma, as it can also refer to the right action. Everybody has to do their karma. So the, the point is that karma can have many different meanings. And that's why itself, it can become com complicated. Yeah. So, for example, the English word run, it is supposed to have 540 meanings. I am hmm? going for a run. I am I am running because my car has stopped running. <laughs> I am running away from this country because this person is running for president. <laughs> So sometimes when we use a word, you say, I am, I am running away to America. Somebody asks, how will you run across the ocean? <laughs> so we are two people are using the word in two different senses of the meaning. So like that karma can also refer to different things. But I'll talk about karma more from a practical perspective to understand how understanding karma can help us function more effectively. So in general, our belief is that if we do an action, there will be a result. Hmm? There will be some result. So you know, if a child comes back from school and has got some scratch on the arm, what happened, we'll ask. Said, no, it just happened by chance. No, what happened? Something must have happened by chance, it caused it. So when we see a result, we presume there is a cause. And when we see an action, we understand there will be a result of that. So in general, we can say action leads to result. Mm -hmm. That is a basic understanding of karma. Mm -hmm. But it's not that simple. So you can say this is karma and this is follow. Mm -hmm. So I will take this understanding and education has two parts to it. Education is to make the simple complicated and makes the complex simple. It depends on what is required. Hmm? So, for example, when we are teaching a child, teaching a child colors, first we will say, okay, this is black, this is white. And that's why there are oppos very opposite colors and we make it very clear. Okay, this is black, this is white. But then afterwards we tell the children, okay, the whole world is not black and white. There are so many shades of gray in between. And they also have to be understood. So in that sense, education has these two aspects to it. Make what, what we think is simple, complex. Or rather, we don't make it complex. We reveal how it is actually complex. It's not that simple. Hmm? And the other aspect is also, don't keep it complex. As much as possible, make the complex simple. So, so we will try to do both today. First, we'll try to understand, we'll start from the simple, we'll make it a little, see, show its complexity, and then we'll come back to the simplicity. So this is at a very s simple level. Karma means action leads to result. So this is at a very simple level. Now we can add one layer of complexity to is, if there is action, And then there is result. There is something in between. And that is time. Not all actions lead to results immediately. If I put my hand in fire, I'll get burned immediately. But if I go out in the sun for maybe 6 hours, 8 hours, 10 hours, then maybe I'll get some sunburn after some time. Maybe my skin will get rash. Maybe if there's too much exposure, somebody might get some kind of skin cancer also or some other skin diseases. So actions don't lead to results immediately. So between karma and phala, there is also kala. So karma with kala will lead to phala. So for example, if you plant a tree, then if you plant some some shrubs or herbs, they might grow within a few months. If you plant a mango tree, it might take a long time. Now, if a mother tells a child, you, know, you should eat, drink this milk, you will know, become strong by it. 
okay, then the child drinks a glass of milk and then looks at his muscles and not becomes stronger. <laughs> well, there, karma will lead to phala, but kala is there. It's not one day it's going to happen. You take nutritious food regularly, then you will become stronger. So that's one factor, karma and kala. But now sometimes, uh, karma may not seem to lead to any phala at all. So, for example, you know, some people, if you see, they, they have a little poor digestive system. So, there's little imbalance in their food and immediately their health gets upset, their body gets bloated and things go wrong. And for them, the karma leads to follow very immediately. But somebody else, you know, they seem to treat their tongue like a conveyor belt. <laughs> <laughs> Anything and everything they eat, and still nothing seems to happen to them. They remain fed, they remain slim. So, sometimes it may appear that karma doesn't lead to any fall. And that is why we often have the question, why do say? What is the common question? Why do bad things happen to good people? You know, I'm doing good, but instead of getting something good, I'm getting something bad. Or there's the opposite questions. You know, why do good things happen to bad people? <laughs> is it, it's, that's also there. So that is where one more factor comes in. That, see there is, we could say action, but it's more specifically it is present action. Hmm? And then there is time, and then there is result. But, it's not just that, this is karma, kala, and what is this? Fala, the result. But there's one more factor here. That is, you can say, past action. And this is called as daiva. So, daiva also contributes. So, for example, let's start with something simple. Say, some kids maybe say very good at language. Mm -hmm. They just have a like, maybe some kids are very good at music. Some people, kids are maybe very good at art. So, they draw something and people can't believe oh, a five-year-old child do this. Somebody drives up, draw, draws up, say, a peacock, a beautiful peacock. See, I can't believe that a five-year-old child drew, drew it. And then some other child drives a peacock and he feels, I can't believe this is a peacock. <laughs> <laughs> so, now what happens is, there is, the, now both may spend them on the same amount of time. Maybe both, one child spends about half an hour drawing, second child also spends half an hour drawing. So, why the difference? That is, here we see there is a talent. There is talent which is almost something like a starting point in this life. Different people have different talents. And the talent that we get in this life comes from our Purva Karma. Hmm? That is our Daiva. Now talent could be one thing. It could also be wealth. Mm -hmm. It could be looks. It could be IQ. There are different things which we get from our Purva Karma. Hmm? And the Purva Karma also shapes how we get the fala. So now exactly in which fact situation, how much these factors will contribute, that can vary. So for example, somebody, some even now the Cricket World Cup is going on. Now some batsmen are just so phenomenally talented. You know, any kind of ball, they can hit any kind of shot. And others... You know, they can't even imagine moving their hand and arms like that. And it's a fast coming ball and they just swing and hit. So, there are some people just extraordinarily talented. So, for them, they, don't, they may not even need to practice too much. For somebody else, the practice is required a lot. So, the point I'm making is, sometimes we may say that this past action... This past action may play 50% role. This may play 50% role. And that's how the 100% comes up. 
Sometimes the past action may play 10% role, the present action may play 90% role. Hmm? Sometimes the past action may 90% and the present may be 10%. That means the person has so much talent that they don't really have to work very hard. Hmm? So, I, I'm a, I write, I write, I'm a writer, I write many books. So I have I know different kinds of authors. So one of my friends, he says that he just gets the whole idea of an article in his mind ready. He says, in his mind's, mind's eye, he even gets the vision of the paragraph breaks. Okay, this paragraph will end here, this paragraph will start here. And you know, I said, I don't get like that, I have to work hard. So, and, but I know somebody, some other people, they have to work much harder than what I have to work. So he can write one paragraph within 15 minutes. For me, one hour, one paragraph may take about, not one paragraph, maybe 500 words, he can write within 15 minutes. It takes me one hour for one fee. Somebody else, it may take two, three or four hours. So how much of the present and the past, <coughs> present actions contribute and how much the past actions contribute? That can vary from person to person. That depends on the kind of karma that a person has from the past. So we could say totally there is daiva plus karma plus kala leads to phala. So sometimes consider, I'll con I'll I will conclude this part with uh, two examples and then we'll go towards the practical part, what this implies for us. So consider a farmer. Now in farming, we could say the karma will be plowing. Plowing and sowing. Uh, so that is the present action. And farmers have to do that diligently. But then after that, there is kala. There is change of seasons. The, the harvesting season has to come. Only then the crops will come. But along with that, there is rains. Rains in particular and in general we could say the environment. If locusts come, if some pests come, mm -hmm. if a storm comes. So that is Daiva. When Daiva, Karma and Kala all come together, then there will be the Phala. The Phala is the harvest. They will get either they will get a good harvest or they may not get a good harvest. So similarly, if you can consider say, Having a child. When a couple gets married, they may want to have a child. But it is not that just by wanting to have a child, you can have a child. You know, the karma could be the union. But just because there is union, that does not mean there is a child. No. Along with union, conception has to happen. Now, sometimes there is union, but there is no conception. And we can try to find out some medical reasons for that. Sometimes some medical solutions help. Sometimes they don't seem to help. So it's complex. But even when there is conception, then there is gestation. It's not that the conception is that tomorrow the next day the child will be there. So when all these three work together, then there is, there is child. Childbirth that happens. So in every area of our life, these three factors combine together. Karma, Daiva and Kala. So once we understand this, in the Bhagavad Gita's context, Arjuna did not want to fight the war. But Krishna told him that this is Daiva. You did not seek out this war. But this is, this is the situation that has come in your life. And the Gita's focus is not on going into the past to explore. Krishna does not tell Arjuna in the Gita, you know, say Bhishma was this person in the previous life and you were this person and you had done this to them, he had done this to you and you had done that to them and that's why you have to fight. No. The Gita's mood is that if you consider there as these three things, Daiva, Karma and Kala. So these three factors, with respect to Daiva, there has to be acceptance. Hmm? So, we need to learn to accept that there are some things which may not be working out for us. Now, with respect, the acceptance is not the only thing with it. There is also diligence. 
सो इफ इज कर्मण्यवाधिकार स्ते महाफलेशु कदाचन सो दैट वर्स टू पॉइंट फोर्टी सेवन इफ यू कंसिडर द फर्स्ट लाइन ए इज अबाउट कर्म कर्मण्यवाधिकार से यू हैव टू बी डिलीजेंट अबाउट डूइंग योर कर्म बट एट द सेम टाइम महाफलेशु कदाचन वाय बिकॉज वेन इज डोंट बी अटैच टू द फ्रूट्स डोंट थिंक यू आर एंटाइटल टू द फ्रूट्स वाय बिकॉज The action alone doesn't determine the result. Ma karma phala he tur bhur. Don't think the karma alone is the cause of the phala. The karma is one cause, but not the sole cause. Ma karma phala he tur bhur. But at the same time, if you think that the karma is not going to bring the phala, then why do karma at all? No, karma is one cause, but not the sole cause. So ma te sangostwa. Akarmani, don't be, don't become lazy, don't become inactive, don't just uh, think that oh, it's all useless. No, our actions do matter. So, with respect to kala, there has to be patience. Hmm? So, patience with respect to kala, acceptance of daiva, and diligence with respect to karma. These three are. What will lead us towards phala? So, if you consider these three, suppose you know we are going in a particular place where it's tough. If like we wear a pad, like cricket players when they play, they don't want the ball to hit their legs, so they wear a pad. It's a protective. So, like that, this understanding, these three parts, this can be a pad. It it protects us in life. How it. When there is padding in a say a car, then it acts like a shock absorber. So when we are wearing this pad, this philosophical understanding, then that can act like a shock absorber for us. Sometimes I may feel I am working so hard. Why am I? Why am I not getting any result at all? Well, maybe you have to persist for some more time. You have to have patience. Actions don't necessarily lead to results immediately. And sometimes we may have to decide that, yeah, I have tried enough, but in this field it's not working. Then maybe I just stop this and move somewhere else. So maybe this is not not in my destiny. I guess I started giving the example. I think I was suppose uh, there was a student quota and he was trying to get into IIT for seven years. Now the IIT degree is for four years or six years if you are doing a masters. Now spending seven years trying to get into IIT is of not much use. You try once, maybe try twice, and okay, if that doesn't work out. That's not in my destiny. Let me move on to something else. So sometimes we have to accept. Now that does not mean that every time when something doesn't work, we say it's, it's destiny. You know, not like that. You know, if I if I try to draw something and it doesn't work, and I say, my my destiny is not there. Well, no. At that time, we have to try first. Maybe everything everything can be improved by effort. And the question is, how much can it be improved? So destiny may be determining how where our starting point is, and how fast the improvement is. So some people they can have a very rapid learning. Some people learning may be very gradual. So it can vary. But once the overall Gita's mood is of this three things that Arjuna, you be diligent in your duty of fighting. At the same time, accept that this war has come upon you. You didn't go out seeking this war. You know, the Pandavas didn't do anything to antagonize Duryodhan. It was Duryodhan who was envious of them. It was Duryodhan who was targeting them, and his action just went worse and worse and worse. And yes, for dharma to be established, Krishna himself came to establish dharma, but patience. The results don't come immediately. Even when Krishna was with the Pandavas, still the Pandavas went through suffering. The Pandavas, they were. We discussed how. They were attempted to be burned and they were exiled. Fourteen years they had to. Fourteen years? How many years? Thirteen years. Yeah, twelve plus one. Thirteen years they had to be in exile. So like that, they had to struggle, but eventually, they were successful. Now for us to do all these things, I talk about this patience, acceptance, and diligence. All these three becomes easier when we see. that there is krishna's plan for us that 
our events in our life even karma does not happen independently or arbitrarily karma happens karma means i'm talking about how our actions lead to results hmm? how exactly when it is 10% this 90% that all that is under krishna's plan so suppose somebody meets with an accident now that now that was because say somebody was driving drunk and they hit us now that is that person's mistake no doubt but still even that is within krishna's plan krishna will bring something good out of that also if you look at the pandavas situation now the pandavas being burnt alive or attempted to be burnt alive they did nothing over there it was all kauravas planning duryodhana's misdeed so when our when we are suffering right now if then there is present suffering it could be because of various causes it could be because of others misdeeds hmm uh, somebody may be out to hurt us but we see even through that krishna's plan was working the pandavas went to the forest and while they were in the forest they came to know about draupadi swayamvar and they came in draupadi swayamvar and there arjuna won draupadi's hand and thereby they became much stronger than what they were before because draupada was an extremely powerful king so through each adversity even if that adversity was caused by somebody with inimical intention somebody with bad bad intentions still they emerge stronger so even if bad people are doing to bad things to us that is still within krishna's plan for us we will grow we will rise and sometimes our presence are suffering maybe because of our mistakes also say for example we get into accident because maybe we were atten- inattentive you know maybe while driving we are looking at a phone and we we were beat our sense what a foolish person i am yeah we should take responsibility yeah it was a mistake on my part i should not be doing this but even our mistakes are within krishna's plan so yudhishthir when he gambled now yudhishthir didn't gamble because he was a gambling addict he gambled because just before the kurukshetra war or after the rajasu yagya had been performed we asked they he had so we asked they had been presiding the ceremony so he had told we had sought, sought from we asked their blessings he said please that please bless me so that i can rule uh, in an era and bring in an era of peace and prosperity for everyone we asked they became grave when he said that you the i see a very dark future there'll be a terrible war in the future and after that war there'll be the era of peace and prosperity so you still also became pensive he said is there anything i can do to avoid this war so he thought that war how does war occur he had his own reasoning he says war happens because of conflicts hmm now conflicts they grow because there are differences of opinion hmm and those differences escalate because there is disobedience that means if two people have differences if both of them accept a common authority then there is no disobedience say two siblings have a fight both listen to their parents and the issue can be resolved so he thought that to avoid war from happening i will always obey my elders now he took that as a well intentioned vow but then his elders at that time were people like dhritarashtra so now when dhritarashtra sent a message to vidura say that come for this gambling match yudhishthir just couldn't refuse now of course yudhishthir didn't blame oh you know dhritarashtra is so manipulative it was that he took responsibility he said yes i gambled out of obligation but the extent of gambling i got carried away i did not gamble because he wanted to earn some more money but he thought that you know, at least something should be there by which i can take care of my family care of take care of my citizens so it was in one sense a mistake i once i told this story and sometimes after the class i asked you know what do you learn so there's one boy who said 
He said, I learned that obeying our elders is very dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the lesson here. <laughs> so, mm, our elders are unlikely to be like Dhritarashtra. We, we, have to, we, have to, we can't assume like that. But the point is that even if we assume that it was a mistake on your Dhritarashtra side, it's not exactly a mistake. It was more like a misplaced faith. It's not a mistake, but a misplaced faith. He thought the elders will be well wishers. Even he, he knew that Dhritarashtra was attached to Duryodhan. But he never thought that Dhritarashtra would go so far as to have his own daughter-in-law dishonored in public. So, even if it is a mistake, still for argument's sake we assume that. But through that, while the Pandavas were in the forest, they actually became stronger. Arjuna performed austerities by which he got special weapons. Bhima took further training and he practiced his mace fighting even more. Yudhishthir gained further wisdom by discussing with the sages. They performed, they performed tapasya, they did yagya, they got more punya. So through it also they became stronger. So the point is that even if something bad is happening to us, we feel, oh, it is because of my mistake, it is because of others' mistakes, it is because, that is because of destiny, whether it is because of my activity, whatever it is. If we understand that maya dekshina prakriti, it happens under Krishna's plan. Then what we do is we approach that all situations with a service attitude. We pray to Krishna. Krishna, how do you want me to serve you in this situation? Do you want me to persist in this or do you want me to shift to something else? And if we have that prayerful attitude, Tadami Buddhi Yogam Tam, Krishna will guide us from within. He can guide us from without, from our various guides. We can have spiritual guides and mentors. They can guide us. But in this way, we all can make the best of the situation that we are in. And we can, from our present choices, create a brighter, better future for ourselves. And this is the key point of karma. Ultimately, the principle of karma is meant to be empowering. The key, key implication of the principle of karma is that our actions matter. That our choices do matter. And that means by making good choices in the present, each one of us can contribute towards creating a better and brighter future for ourselves, for our loved ones and for ultimately the world at large. So that is the final implication. Karma is actually meant for empowerment. And that is what happens to Arjuna at the end of the Gita. That he is, he is empowered. That same Arjuna uh, who has put aside his bow in dejection. I can't fight. By the end of Gita, he picks, picks up his bow in readiness to fight. So that Arjuna is picking up his bow represents our confidence, our enthusiasm. Sometimes life can be so complicated, it can be so disheartening that we may also put aside our metaphorical bow. I just can't do this, I quit. But then if we understand the wisdom of the Gita, then we can raise our metaphorical bow. We can become confident that our actions matter, that we can create a better brighter future for ourselves. So I'll summarize what I discussed today. I started by talking about the many meanings of the word karma. So karma can mean action, it can mean reaction, it can mean law of action reaction, it can mean duty or good action. So we try to place these various understandings of karma within a philosophical context, philosophical picture. So we talked about how the basic understanding of karma is karma will lead to phala. But then it's not that simple. Making the simple complex, that was the part. So what is, if we complicate, complexify or complicate it, there are three factors. What are the three factors? Does anyone remember? Yes. 
ದೈವ ಪ್ಲಸ್ ಕರ್ಮ ಪ್ಲಸ್ ಕಾಲ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ವಿಲ್ ಲೀಡ್ ಟು ಫಲ ಸೊ ವಿ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸಾಂಪಲ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಫಾರ್ಮಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ಪ್ರೋಕ್ರಿಯೇಟಿಂಗ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ವಿ ಟಾಕ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಡಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಂಪ್ಲಾಯ್ ಫಾರ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಸ್ ಸೊ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ದೆನ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಥ್ರೀ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಆರ್ ಥ್ರೀ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಪಿ ವಾಸ್ ಪೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಪೇಷನ್ಸ್ ವಿತ್ ರಿಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ ಟು ಕಾಲ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ವಿಲ್ ಟೇಕ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಸೊ ಲೆಟ್ ಮೀ ವೈಲ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಮೈ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ ಬಿ ಪೇಷಂಟ್ ವಿ ವೇಟ್ ಎ ವಾಸ್ ಸೊ ಎಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟೆನ್ಸ್ ವಾಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ವಾಟ್ ದೈವ ಎಸ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಯಾ ಸರ್ಟನ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಮೇ ನಾಟ್ ಬಿ ಹ್ಯಾಪ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ಮೈ ಲೈಫ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಮೀ ಎಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಡಿ ವಾಸ್ ಡಿಲಿಜೆನ್ಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಕಾಮನ್ ಅ ವರ್ಡ್ ಯಾ ಡಿಲಿಜೆನ್ಸ್ ಬೇಸಿಕಲಿ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಆನ್ ಇನ್ ಆರ್ ಟು ಪುಷ್ ಆನ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ವಿತ್ ರಿಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ ಟು ಕರ್ಮ so in pa- in in doing our duty we need to be diligent and all this can be done if we have a seva bhav if we have a service attitude that krishna you have a plan for me i have that faith so please guide me how do you want me to serve you so even if our present karma is messed up we make some mistakes or because of our past karma we have some person who is like an enemy in our life and who is hurting us even in all those situations Krishna's plan will guide us towards a better place. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, it's out of all these things, uh, it was just a thought while listening to you that what i understand is that arjuna at the beginning of mahabharat was not very fine because he thought they are my relatives what is the use of this all the same and by preaching or desha from lord krishna he was changed hmm. on the other hand we are summarizing that everything happens to the will of krishna he wants everything to happen was there any possibility that krishna could have changed the rajana okay yes why didn't you try yes so is it possible that krishna could have changed duryodhana see in general when you took a cause of actions it's a complex field it's a field of philosophy it is called etiology now etiology is also used in terms of diseases and how what causes diseases but that's more in medical terms etiology causality is also a part of disease it's a cause of philosophy cause in philosophy also so there are broadly three factors there is god's will there is free will and there is evil <laughs> <laughs> so now god's will is the supreme cause but not the sole cause that means yes it is true that nothing happens without god's will but that does not mean everything is caused by god's will so so how do you understand this difference supreme cause not sole cause just like rains are the supreme cause of vegetation on the earth but the rains don't determine which specific vegetation is going to grow where that depends on what kind of seeds are sown so similarly there is the there is a supreme cause that is god's will but beyond that there is free will so every individual has free will and krishna doesn't override people's free will mm-hmm. so krishna went as shanti doot krishna went as a peace messenger personally to seek peace now that is like say in the russia ukraine war say either the russian premier or the ukrainian premier personally goes to the opposite king opposite leader and seeks peace normally you have lower level maybe some general some commander some secretary of state lower level people go when there is peace missions but if a top person goes that means they are really serious and what was uh, duryodhan's response he said i will not give you enough land to even put the tip of a needle through it 
लाइफ दैट हैड बीन दर सोशल मीडिया दैट वेड बी वायरल इंस्टाग्राम रील क्या डायलॉग है बट इन द कॉन्टेक्सट इट जस्ट शोज दुर्योधन अरोगंस इट्स लाइक से there's a there's some program some ceremony some festival at our home and we invite some somebody some acquaintance now they don't want to come so they make an excuse now they are making an excuse we we know that they are making an excuse and they know that we know that they are making an excuse <laughs> but still out of courtesy they are making an excuse but they say even if i die my dead body will never come to your program Now that is not just a refusal to the invitation; it is a kick in the face of the inviter. Isn't it? So Duryodhan's words were like that. When something like that happens, then there is nothing that can be done. So f- evil is not some being, some st- some strange being that exists somewhere and does something. Evil is like is a conditioning. it is a conditioning that is extremely hardened that person has deep rooted envy deep rooted lust deep rooted greed and they just not try to give it up it becomes everybody may have some lust some greed some anger but some people's anger is such that they may take up a knife and stab someone to death kill someone and they don't even feel anything bad about it that is deadly that is where things become evil so if this has happened then there has there is no peaceful solution so <clears throat> so that that so sometimes it's just not possible even for god to change a person krishna tried his best okay thank you thank you any other questions would you for someone who leads a very godly life and he does all the good deeds in the world there and still if they probably in their life they have some physical ailments or they have suffering there is it because it was because of daiva is it something passed from their past life there or why do they suffer more as compared to if everything has been destined by krishna's will or by god's will so why they have to suffer in that like they said in this okay. life you have to do the karma and you have to bhog it as well okay so now if we want to look at if somebody is doing good then what is the cause of suffering that if they are getting some get going through some difficulties well anything in this world generally has multiple levels of causes it's not just one cause so what caused a particular suffering is difficult to know gahana karmano gati krishna says it's complex so in general we can say whether a person lives a virtuous life or a vicious life there are good people or bad people everybody still has to grow old everybody still will get diseased everybody will have to die so we could say there is like a baseline suffering that is universal hmm. now you could of course say that everybody has to grow old and get sick and die but you know, some people when they grow old you know maybe they have not taken care of their health throughout their life they eaten unhealthily and they have been then maybe the quality of their life in the last 10 15 20 years is very poor then that is far greater suffering everybody will age but not everybody ages in the same way hmm? so the extent of disease and distress in old age that can depend on one's present karma also and that's why if somebody cultivates healthy habits in their youth in their childhood uh, in their middle ages even if not earlier then they can have a better quality of life towards the end that's another factor so this baseline suffering is universal then our present karma can also lead to some suffering hmm? now generally speaking the understanding when we are analyzing suffering is to move from the drushta to the adrushta move first from the visible cause toward the invisible cause so when we immediately escalate towards the immediate cause to towards the invisible cause now beyond that say somebody has always had very healthy habits 
and still maybe they get some disease like cancer. Now why did that happen? Now biologically, medically, we can try to find out some cause, but it's there's some diseases which are very difficult to find out specific causes for them. We could say it's pollution, it's this, it's this, but if those were the causes, then everybody should be getting it. Why do some people get it and some people don't? So that is where we can go towards past karma as an explanation. But there's one very important caveat over here. That if somebody is suffering, it is not our position to judge people based on their past karma. Hmm? Our focus should be not what is whose past karma. Our focus should be what is my present dharma. Hmm? Say for example, if somebody is sick, now a doctor should not be thinking, oh, this person is sick because of their past karma. <laughs> no, if I am a doctor, then my present dharma is to treat the person. If we start escalating all causes to past karma, that is how actually the caste system came and caste system became extremely discriminatory. And okay, you are, you are born poor, that is because of your past karma. You are born in this particular caste or this particular ethnic group, that is because of your past karma. And therefore, okay, a starting point may be determined by past karma. But that does not mean that that particular group of people have to suffer for the rest of their life or the rest of history. So when that, when every suffering and its cause is escalated to the past karma, then that's when we start becoming heartless. It, compassion, kindness, all that start getting lost. So for example, if a uh, baby is crying. A newborn baby is crying. Should the mother think the baby is crying because of past karma? <laughs> that would be monstrous. Isn't it? Oh, let me do something to comfort the child. Now sometimes, despite the parents best comforting, the child may not become peaceful. Now that may be because uh, maybe the child has some, some physical pain or something like that which you are not able to detect. And maybe some children are a little, they cry more than others. So when the drushta solution, when the visible solution doesn't work, and so for the visible solution, we should be diligent. But if it doesn't work, then we have to have some acceptance. That's, uh, so we shouldn't be ju jumping towards, so the focus or our focus we should be n people's past karma. That should never be the past. If that becomes the focus, then that will make us actually heartless. This is what can lead to perpetuation of injustice and uh, cruelty also. We focus on our present dharma. Okay, In this situation, if I have a service attitude, I am by God's arrangement in this situation where this person is suffering. So what can I do about it? So this will actually make us kind. It will make us helpful. Mm. And that is what we need in human society. Okay? Thank you. Any other questions? Is there any way uh, we can measure karma? You know, because there is a time delay. There is a? There is a time. Kala. Hmm. Kala. So why doing karma? Is there any way we can know that this is a good karma or bad karma and then we can adjust our actions. Okay, can we know which is a good karma and which is bad karma? Well, there are two different things. One is knowing, the other is measuring. Well, measuring is difficult. See, many things in, in life, they are important for us, but they're not measurable. So, for example, if somebody is sick and they're in pain, you know, we can ask them a degree of pain, how much is 1 to 10? And they may say 10,000. <laughs> they may say it's unbearable pain, whatever it is. But, you know, we don't have anything like a painometer. You know, put on the body of the patient and say, oh, how, let's see how much pain you are in. So there are many things in life which, cannot, which are not subject to mathematical measurement. But still, we can evaluate broadly. You know, if somebody's arm is like completely misaligned, hey, you must be in some pain, some serious pain over here, like that. So, broadly speaking, the principle of karma is harmony. When we say our actions matter, what it means is that 
each one of us is a part of larger units that we belong to so we we are a part of a family we are a part of a community we are a part of a country we are a part of the planet earth so for um, every larger unit that is maybe there it can be family community country planet of all of these from each one of these we take some things hmm? so if we consider the country from the country we take certain facilities now if we are taking something we no need to be giving something so if you are working in a company we are taking salary from the company and the idea is we should be giving something we should be working we should be doing our job so if we are driving on a road and we are a part of that road transport system so we are taking the facility of the roads then we have to do something in return that is we have to follow the rules so karma in one sense is basically a harmonious way of belonging to a larger whole that we are a part of and if we if we don't do our part in that that is the beginning of bad karma just like if somebody drives way above the speed limit you know that is culpable that person will be fined for that so similarly for all of us from the various units that we are taking something we need to be giving something so suppose somebody gambles the gambling is basically what we are we, generally we work hard and we get money but somebody is trying to get quick money mm. so that is considered unhealthy and unhe unethical if somebody for example engages in meat eating now we have to eat food and if you look at our biology we look at our anatomy our bodies are much more oriented for vegetarian food then non vegetarian food so we have to we can't avoid causing pain even plants when they are killed there is some pain but say when we take fruits we are not killing anyone even if we take harvest of crops if we don't cut the crops they are just going to die but with respect to animals it's not like that you know when they are in the prime of their life we cut them we kill them cause them pain and we eat so basically what are we doing we are cause you could say taking more than what is necessary we are causing more pain than what is necessary mm -hmm. so that is considered wrong so bad karma is basically a disharmonious way of belonging to the universe so if there is say unrestrained sexual activity you know before marriage or outside marriage then what is the person doing see the reproduction is a basic human function but when one takes without giving it is without any responsibility without any boundaries then there are consequences for that so that so when something is considered bad karma that is not just some some people have decided something this is bad and that some people's morality being imposed on everyone no it is broadly an understanding of what is harmonious okay yes one more question yes uh, this is about remedy part because we listen to read and we try to understand that we should channelize our side towards the service and good karma but our monkey mind always try to debate us what is the proper way of channelizing the mind towards the right path so how do we direct our mind towards the right path well, firstly it requires lifelong practice it's not easy but there are some things which we can do to make it easier for us so <clears throat> broadly it is see, internally we have to strengthen our self with intelligence at least we are convinced that this is not good for me so then even when we are doing something so suppose somebody likes to eat a lot of unhealthy food 
Mm-hmm. Now maybe the unhealthy food is tasty. And, you know, we don't want to just be austere throughout our life. We want to eat some foods. But then, if I, by intelligence, I'm convinced this food is harmful, or at least not, unbe- not beneficial, then we will maintain some boundaries. So if that intellectual conviction itself is not there, then there is no reason to oppose the mind. And the thing is that intelligence has to be repeatedly nourished. It is our intelligence, it is not like a fixed deposit. It is not that one day I invested and it will stay like that forever. No, it is like a stock that is constantly dwindling. If every single day, I may make a resolution, this is good for me, this is what I am going to do. But it's every day that keeps dwindling, it keeps decreasing. So that's why regularly nourishing our intelligence. So coming to satsang like this, studying the Bhagavad Gita, all this is meant to nourish our intelligence. Hmm. Now, the second thing that we all need, along with intelligence, is, my man says intelligence does the same thing, but externally also, we need to create some boundaries for ourselves. So Krishna talks about this in 3.43, evam buddhe param buddhva. That with your intelligence, you connect yourself with that which is good for you. But at the same time, the world is always going to prompt us, to pull us, tempt us towards that which is not so good for us. Therefore, each one of us needs to create boundaries for ourselves. While society itself provides us some boundaries. But beyond that, each of us, based on where we are vulnerable, we need to create some boundaries. Krishna talks about this in 340. That, say for example, if somebody is an alcoholic and they want to give up alcoholism, but their home is right next to a bar. I am very sincere about giving up alcoholism. Well, if you are sincere, then you really need to relocate. If if you are right next to a bar, then there will be no bar for you to go to the bar. (laughs) So, we will all, even the best intentioned people, will all have moments of weakness. So, we can't constantly rely either on our intelligence or on our willpower. We need to help ourselves by having some boundaries. Indriyanya Adau, Krishna says. So boundaries is like protection. Sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, sometimes the best way to deal with temptation is to not deal with temptation. Don't put yourself in situations where you will be tempted. Again, this is not always possible. But wherever it's possible, it's helpful. And then last is purification. So... Intelligence, in one sense, gives us conviction. Hmm? Conviction is, this is right. And boundaries is, I'll make it difficult for myself to do the wrong. That means, I'll create some obstacles between myself and doing the wrong thing. But beyond that, each one of us has to purify ourselves. So, purification is where we change the tendency of the mind. So, in one sense, what we are saying is here, the Gita explains... That the mind is in between. Above the mind is the intelligence. And below the mind are the senses. Mm -hmm. This Krishna talks about this in 341. So what we are doing is, we are doing a three-pronged attack. First is intelligence, there is conviction. We strengthen our intelligence. Then for the senses, there is regulation. Okay, create some boundaries. And gradually for the mind, there is purification. Especially when we practice bhakti, when we connect our mind with Krishna, hmm, by remembering Him, by chanting His holy names, then that purifies the mind. So this is the final solution. So the more we are connected with Krishna through bhakti, the kama, krodha, lobha, the lust, anger, greed, within will start decreasing. And that is when the mind's tendency to go in the unhealthy directions will itself decrease. Okay? Thank you. Hare Krishna. Any other questions? Yes, please. Thank you, Prabhuji, for wonderful class. <clears throat> As we 
mentioned that we all do mistakes and when we have done mistake, the time comes when you realize it and you feel guilty. So how does one get out of that point? Like you need some, like some um, prompt to come out of that state. So how, how do we cultivate or how we come out of that state? Okay, you're talking about the state of guilt or yes. the state of committing mistakes because they're two different things. No, one, one has already committed mistake, then you realize that I committed mistake and you're guilty about it. So from that guilt level, how do you rise? Okay. So dealing with the guilt, this is itself a whole, you could have a whole talk on this. But briefly, there are two extremes. One is, you can have too much guilt. And you can have too little guilt. So, too little guilt is where like, some people do wrong, some people do bad, and they don't feel bad at all. And that's really bad. Is it to such people? It's it's suppose you know we are walking along through a crowded road, we are rushing somewhere because there's some emergency, and while going along, we step on somebody's foot. Now, if you realize that, oh, I'm sorry. Hmm? But suppose somebody steps on somebody's foot and says, oh, that's you. They deliberately raise their foot and bang it again. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hurt you. They don't feel anything bad at all. Now that's really bad. So too, especially in today's world. Hmm, where morality has become quite relativized. You know, you think that is right for you, that is right for you. This is right for me, this is right for me. So when morality is relativized, often a big problem is too little guilt. And then too, when there is too little guilt, that can lead to very easy relapses. People keep doing the same thing again and again. And not only relapses, the relapses can also be worsened. Hmm? So... I did a bad thing and then I do worse thing thereafter. So one extreme is, it leads to I do terrible things. But on the other hand, if there is too much guilt, then what happens is, it's like in, we, are, we are standing above ourselves in judgment and we are beating ourselves up, beating ourselves up. You're like, okay, you fell down, if somebody has fallen down, you don't uh, kick a fallen dog, as they say. You don't, you don't beat them down. You help them rise. So if there is too much guilt, then what happens is it makes one hopeless. Hmm? So you could say if there is too little guilt, it makes one shameless. Hmm? Hmm? But if there is too much guilt, it makes one hopeless. And one of this hopeless means basically what happens, not that I do terrible things, I start thinking, I am terrible. No, it is, I did a terrible thing. I did a wrong thing. So, in general, how do we find the balance of the right quantity of guilt? It is basically two things. If there is the balanced quantity of guilt, it helps us on one side to take responsibility. Hmm? Okay, I made a mistake. But that responsibility is not only to that I made a mistake. But responsibility also is that I can rise above that mistake. And we have to understand that ultimately even God can't help us if we don't want to help ourselves. So it is, like I said, God's free will is, su God's f will is supreme, but our free will is also important. So if we are not ready to help ourselves then no one can help us. So, the balance is centered on, mm, you could say, acknowledgement or admission. I admit that I made a mistake. But it's also rectification. Rectification of the mistake to the extent it is possible and rectification of myself. That I have to raise myself. And for both of these, we need to be able to take responsibility. So, okay, I made a mistake and I'm sorry about it. I'll do what I can to fix it. But ultimately, I am my most fundamental hope. If I start beating myself up, then who is going to pick me up? So that's why we, we cannot have a, um, 
we often talk about improving our relationship with others and that's important but just as we need to have healthy relationship with others we also need to have a healthy relationship with ourselves and that means we should not be beating ourselves up too much internally okay thank you anyone last question before we stop oh, yeah. oh there uh, are two more okay yeah, yeah Why is the whole the um, always full of expectation? Like, if someone is working or just in general, so someone might do a very good job, but in the back of the manager probably still the manager will be happy, or just in general the whole world would expect more. So same with the musician, someone might sing really good, but the audience might still go for yeah we expect it. Okay. So the world always expects more from us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what do we do about it? Well, in general there are two ex uh or rather there are two parts not ex it could be ex extremes but it for growth let me put it this way then come to the pendulum for growth consider parenting. If you are parenting a child there are two aspects to it there is every parent has a right to expect from the children not only a right but responsibility you know that there is there is so much potential in you and if you develop good habits you work hard you can do a lot that expecting is essential but along with that accepting is also essential you know if there is only expecting <laughs> then what happens is there is too much pressure mm-hmm. on the other hand there is only accepting then there is stagnation the parents say oh, to the child you know okay whatever you study whatever marks you get well, it's all fine Well, uh, how many children are likely to study isn't it it's it's very rare so there has to be some but what happens is if there is only expecting and no accepting then the child may start feeling that my parents don't really love me or rather i have to achieve something to purchase their love no the parents should always love their child but then there is expectation and that expectation is for the good of the child also so in every relationship especially in a parenting relationship if the parents and children have a good communication then the child parents can also sense you no know, am i expecting too much over here and maybe i need to tone down or maybe i am accepting too much over here maybe we need to push and that is why throughout human history there have always been families means two parents nowadays because of various things there are single parent families and you know, those who have single parent families and they are raising children that's a very difficult task and if they are doing it trying to do it well that needs to be appreciated but at the same time broadly speaking in a parental relationship one parent will play the, the role of more of accepting and the other parent will play the role of more of expecting now who will be what maybe traditionally the fathers would expect and the mothers would accept but it could be other way also whatever it is but there has to be that du- dual role and it's best that the two roles are played by two parents so now in our lives also we need to have both kinds of people so if we feel that there we are having too many people who are expecting too much from us then at one level it is good because they are pushing us to do more but if that is the only kind of people we have then we will be insecure we will be really uncomfortable we will feel too stressed so we also need to have some people who accept us and that is why many times when somebody becomes a celebrity you know, then people have very high expectations of celebrities no you should it's almost like you should be walking in the air or something like that <laughs> is it it so often celebrities they don't know whom to trust whom to connect with so maybe if they have some friends with those people who who were their friends before they became celebrities 
Then they say, I can just be normal with you. Isn't it? That means when I am with you, there is no expectation. So we do need some people who accept us. So try to find out. If you feel the, if you feel the burden of expectation being too much, try to find some people who accept us. And spend some time with them. Then that insecurity will decrease. So there will be people like that also. There are people who care for us for who we are. Not what we achieve. If we achieve something, they are happy for us. But their relationship with us, with us is not depend on what we achieve. Depend on what we achieve. So if you have such a relationship, cherish them. Make time for them. Okay? Thank you. Yes, bro. You, uh, thank you for guiding us. One thing in mind is, you know, we always talk about guilt and purification. But that starts from what is right and what is wrong. That itself is a very fluid state. What is right for me is wrong for other persons. And what is wrong for other persons would be right for me. And how do you decide that? Okay. Because what uh, a lot okay. of Pandavas did was wrong, but there were a lot of things which Kaurvas did wrong. But how do you, you know, okay. you know Gita is That's a, a good prime point. example where we. That's a good point. So. Were you there when I answered the point about harmony, that question? Uh, I talked about belonging. You came just now? Okay. So basically I had answered that question that kar what is right and wrong is bas determined by harmonious belonging. We all belong to, where was this? We all belong to various holes bigger than ourselves. So I'm driving on a traffic. I'm driving on a road. Then there is a right way of driving. There is a wrong way of driving. And that's not a matter of opinion. Hmm? That's a matter of objective fact. So ultimately, karma and accountability for karma is based on the right and wrong ways of belonging to the universe. So having said that, yes, there are, there are two broad conceptions of ethics. Or many, I talk about ethics is basically the analysis, the system that analyzes, analyzes what is right and wrong. So now, in ethics... There is absolute ethics hmm? or it is called as categorical ethics where this is right and this is wrong. Hmm? And now the opposite of ethics is absolute is relative. That's what I mean, we say, okay, this is right for you, that is right for me. Hmm? But you see that and we see many times traditional morality was more towards absolute ethics. Contemporary morality is going toward more towards relative ethics. But ultimately, nobody can live completely with relative ethics. Hmm? Because, say somebody asks, you know, it's all subjective, it's all relative. Well, then you can ask such a person, is there anyone in the world right now who you think is doing something wrong? You say, of course, you know, there are terrorists who kill innocent people. There are child abusers, there are rapists. We all have that understanding that some things are wrong. Now, this was the after the Second World War, there were the Nuremberg trials where the Nazi leaders, they were tried. And their standard defense was, we were only following orders. So they had the gas chambers in which they just killed over 6 million Jews. And they said, we are following orders. And the principle in military is that we follow orders. And therefore, we didn't do anything wrong. He says, no. You, you have to follow orders. But there's a basic sense of humanity which everyone has to have. And when you are just killing innocent people brutally, that is wrong. So relativizing ethics completely doesn't work. Nobody works like that. I was speaking in Amazon in Seattle and the same question came up. So I may give a similar example. And after that, uh, one of the attendees, he was a senior manager in Amazon. He said that, you know, he says, I, we also don't agree with relative ethics entirely. He says, because he said that we are a company which sells products. And say when they have that whole section on apparel, what clothes people wear, and they will show men and women wearing those clothes. Sometimes those clothes can be quite revealing. But they say, when it comes to children's clothes, we will not show children wearing those clothes. 
because we don't want in any way to encourage pedophilia we don't want in any way to fuel people who have sexual desires towards small children so although this is a commercial company but still they have some boundaries so the point i'm making is we cannot say there is no no category of right and wrong so the more proper understanding is that between absolute and relative there is contextual so ethics is contextual means what first of all there is action itself and the action can be right or wrong so just focusing on the action to determine what is right and wrong that is categorical ethics this is the category of right there is a the category of wrong but all the mahabharat says that if we consider action alone doesn't determine there is also the intent of the action so speaking truth is good and normally we should always speak the truth but suppose there is a riot going on and people of a particular community are being targeted and a friend of ours from that community comes running to our house please save me please protect me and then we hide our friend in the basement and then those rioters come and bang our door is he here so what should we do at that time should we speak the truth speaking truth is good but in that case it's not the best, not the right thing to do so why because the con- so you could say here rather than action let's put the word here it's more of content it's content of the action what exactly am i doing so there is content of the action there is intent of the action and then there is the effect of the action or the consequence of the action so what is right and wrong has to be determined by considering all these factors so it may seem that the pandavas also did some wrong things but if you look at the broader context in which the pandavas did their things you know it was from the from the categorical ethics perspective it might have been wrong from the absolute ethics perspective but it was not just simply relative there was some deliberation over there when when duryodhan did when he tried to poison bhima or he tried to burn the pandavas alive you know that was out of pure spite hmm? but when the pandavas did something it was you could say a necessary strategy at that particular point it was not out of spite okay thank you okay this is for bhagavad gita chapter 4.18 18 karmanya karmaya pashyad karmanjik one who says i i i really have to give a separate class for this <laughs> but but let me try let me try to explain see karmanya karma ya pashyed a karmanincha karma ya sa buddhiman manushyeshu sa yukta krishna karma krut so what is krishna saying over here karmanya akarma ya pashyed so he says what is the vision that one should have karmanya akarma that means when somebody has done action in that action you see in action karmanya akarmaya pashyet and another says kar akarmani cha karmaya so when somebody is doing in action you see action and krishna says if you have such a vision that person is wise now if we read this verse we may have to conclude we are not wise <laughs> isn't it <laughs> but some see it's always when we translate from one language to another there is a certain level of complexity but if you look at the sanskrit what i said we i t- talked about earlier how karma and a karma karma has multiple meanings so what does this verse mean that to see action karmanya akarmaya pashye to see in action in action so what is mean action here means activity and in action here a karma rather so the sanskrit words are karma and a karma so a karma can refer either to okay let me put it this way i have to complicate it before simplifying it little bit see karma can mean many things but two things at one level it can mean activity hmm? and if karma means activity 
then a karma can mean inactivity. Hmm? Now karma can also mean hmm, a culpable action or action for which we are responsible. Karma means action that leads to reaction. Hmm? And if we take that meaning, then a karma will mean action that leads to no reaction. So for now how can there be an action that leads to no reaction? Well, yes, say suppose then an ordinary person gets angry and shoots the other person. That's that's murder. But if somebody is a soldier on the battlefield and that person shoots the enemy. No, that is not culpable. That person will not be held responsible for that. So there can be action that leads to reaction and action that does not lead to reaction. So karma can mean these two things. Correspondingly, a karma can mean two different things. Okay. So now from this perspective, a karm karmanya a karma ya pashed. The first line means even when there is activity, there is no reaction. That's one, one case Krishna is saying. And the other is, there is inactivity, but there is reaction. That is, that is action that will lead to reaction. So, let's give, take a simple example for this. Hmm? Say, if a surgeon hmm, cuts a patient, now cutting somebody's stomach is a terrible thing to do. But if a surgeon is doing that, that is action that will lead to no reaction. You don't know the police are going to arrest the patient, surgeon. No, because the context is such that. That is action that will lead to no reaction. So in the context of the battlefield, Krishna is telling Arjuna that you are a Kshatriya. That means you, Kshata Trayate Iti Kshatriya. You are meant to protect Kshata's injury. You have to protect people from hurt and injury. You are a martial guardian of society. And when you fight to curb anti-social elements, then you won't be held responsible for those actions. So, karmanya akarmaya pashed. Hmm? On the other hand, akarmani cha karmaya. That, suppose, say again in a hospital setting, now there is, maybe the emergency ward, or just a hospital setting in ICU, suddenly all the sensors start beeping. And a patient is having a heart attack or something. And the medical person will just stand there and don't do anything. And he said, we didn't do anything. And that's why we are punishing you. <laughs> Isn't it? Inaction can be culpable. There are, in law there are mistakes of commission and mistakes of om crimes of commission. That means you sanctioned it, you did it or you got others to do it. And crimes of omission. Well, it's a crime because you didn't do what you are expected to do. So Krishna is saying, Arjuna, in this situation, you may think that if you don't fight, then you are not doing anything. But by not doing anything, you are doing a lot. And you will be culpable for that. So basically, the whole mood of the verse is, don't judge actions only by their externals. Oh, this person is fighting, therefore this person is bad. This person is not fighting, oh, this person is good. No. Somebody may be fighting for a good cause and somebody may not fighting for a bad cause. Isn't it? So it depends. So that's a sabuddhiman manusheshu. That person who can see beyond externals to internals, that is a wise person. Okay. So thank you very much for your thoughtful participation. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gaur Bhakta Vrindaki, Hitai Gaur Premanande.